Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is our first court fall quarter event for the Career Center for the Education on Profit and Government Career Community. My name is Ellie Santonato. I am the ENPG uh, Career Advisor. Um, part a little bit about my role here is I host events like these throughout the quarter. I offer career advising appointments. And so if you have any questions about resumes, cover, lover, cover letters, or internships, anything under the sun related to careers, feel free to book an appointment with me. You can go ahead and call our office, come visit us in the Schmidt, Schmidt Academic Center, or make a Handshake account and schedule an appointment via Handshake. I am very excited because today we are going to listen to Sarah. Sarah currently works at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency, and we're going to learn a little bit about what a job is like in urban planning. And for everyone recording, for the viewers at home listening to this later, uh, feel free to reach out via email for any questions. Great. We are going to go ahead and get started. So the first question that we have for Sarah today is, can you share a little bit about your position uh, within CMAP and kind of a brief description of what that may entail? Yeah, of course. Um, so I am an associate analyst at CMAP. Um, so I work in the research analysis and programming division. Um, we have several different divisions, including um, public affairs, communications, planning, um, but I work in research analysis and programming. Um, so this is a lot of the data work that we do. Um, and I'm specifically on the transportation improvement program team. So I do a lot with for all working to make sure that bicycling, pedestrians, um, everyone is safe on the roads. Um, we do crash analysis data. So we look at where busy intersections are, what we could do to improve it. Um, and I also do a lot of stuff with government finance. So part of the programming role within urban planning has to do with looking at the grants that we have and kind of turning them into projects and making what we call a program of projects. We're like, this is actually what we're gonna do for federal fiscal year 23, for example, is what we're working on right now. Um, so we do a pretty wide array of things. And what's nice is that a lot of people on um, my team still work within different teams and different divisions even. Um, so I'm working with some of the planning folks on um, safety projects. I'm a big cyclist in Chicago in my real life. Um, so having those interests and having those passions, um, there's a lot going on where you can not only kind of work with the data sets and be in Excel all day, but you could also do a lot, you know, to actually tangibly look at policy and what's going on in the city. Yeah, and it's really great to hear that like so much of your personal interest can translate translate over into your professional life. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier before the recording, but you were reminding me that you are a fairly recent graduate from DePaul. So can you talk a little bit about what your professional journey has been, maybe what you studied while you were a student here at DePaul and kind of how you built experience prior to graduation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a DePaul alum. I was at DePaul from 2018 to 2021. So I was there for three years. Um, I was a double major in economics and political science, and I was in the honors program as well. Um, so I was doing a lot in my short time there. Um, but I think that the richness of my course load was really important to gaining kind of just context for the field. Um, not saying you have to be a poli sci major, an econ major, urban studies major, anything specific to know about urban planning. I think there's kind of a wide array. I have people on my team who are even engineers, um, but that was my path. You know, I was very interested not only in social science where the political science side came in, but also data science. And so I was kind of interested in building up both of those skills. I knew that after graduation, it would be really important to me not to just, you know, be in the political world, but also kind of be able to do some of that analysis back up, um, you know, claims, um, work on tangible policy stuff. And so within the economics program I was in, um, there were classes about um, urban economics, as well as, you know, econometrics, things that you're actually analyzing like real laws that have happened in the past, real data that the city of Chicago has collected. Um, I worked with the city of Chicago data portal when I was in school. So kind of that real world experience just in my classes alone and really applying myself um, was a big part of, you know, gaining that experience. I actually had a fellowship 
my first quarter at Tafal. So it was kind of unexpected. Um, it kind of, I don't want to say fell into my lap. Um, I just happened, I was part of the DePaul College Democrats when I first was in school and I was able to connect with someone who was working on the J.B. Pritzker campaign back in 2018. So when he was originally running for governor um, and one thing led to another and I had a full-time fellowship. Um, so that was, a, that was a really cool experience. Um, and so obviously getting involved in campus will help you make those connections. And I truly was involved in every little thing I could be in. Um, so I did that for a while. I realized also then I, cause I went into DePaul as a poli sci major only. And that's kind of when I realized that politics may not specifically be for me. Um, you know, maybe I want to, like I said, do more of that policy analysis, mm -hmm. data work kind of stuff. And that's where econ came in. Um, and I've always been good at math. So I'm like, why not just brush up on those skills, keep that trajectory going. Um, so after that fellowship wrapped up, um, I actually did a number of things on campus that really honed in on my leadership skills. So I was an RA my sophomore year, um, Corcoran Hall, if anyone is in Corcoran Hall, shout out. Um, and although that's not specifically urban planning in any way, again, it was about building connections, having experiences around the city. I was really involved in creating events when I was an RA that like took us to, you know, women's shelters and real community partners in the area. Um, and it just kind of grew my connections, grew my awareness of what's going on in the city, what's available to myself as a DePaul student. Um, so I did that and then um, COVID happened. <laughs> and so that's kind of where my path got a little untraditional. Um, 2020, I was still living in the dorms. I was an RA, moved back home, started to reorient. Um, and I actually went on to go be a building manager at the Ray. <laughs> um, so again, not necessarily any you know, this is the steps that I'm going to take to get this. But instead, it was another thing where it was an interest of mine. It was something I was passionate about, and it was a leadership role. Um, and so I would say my biggest advice, especially to people who may be newer to campus or back on campus after COVID, um, is to just get involved in everything. Really chase those passions because you're going to want opportunities that inform you about yourself. Um, so when I graduated, I was working as a building manager still um, at the Ray, and I knew I loved fitness. Um, and all of that. So I was like, how do I, you know, take this experience in the fitness world and translate it into the government public policy world I want to work in? Um, and yeah, I know we'll get more into my career trajectory after that. Um, but I would definitely say just look out for those opportunities on campus. Um, there is plenty to do student government. Um, I was involved in the residence hall council as well um, when I was a freshman. Um, and just being exposed to people um, of all grade levels was really um, important. But yeah, I didn't really have many internships because of COVID and everything. Um, but it was those, you know, kind of just holding on to every little connection I had that was really important. Yeah, even though you didn't have those what we consider traditional experiences, it still sounds like you really utilize not only DePaul's resources, but just the resources and um, extra experiences we get just from being an urban campus. Mm -hmm. um, you have kind of shared a little bit about this in terms of just like how you came to choose your professional professional pathway. Like you have alluded to like, oh, maybe politics aren't for me. But can you talk a little bit more about kind of that switch from, okay, I'm going to go into politics to I'm going to go into something like public policy based. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely a, um, kind of slow um, experience. And it definitely, it was also people I met in my classes, um, people who were working in, you know, geography and making maps and stuff. I was like, oh my, I would have never heard of this. Um, around, it was always in the back of mind. I knew it was an option. Um, and I am big on LinkedIn. Um, so I always stay connected with people. So seeing what people are up to kind of always made me interested. Um, but after I graduated from DePaul and stopped working at the Ray, I was working at a social services coordination um, position for a while as a community resources researcher. Um, so essentially what I did was create like community data snapshots looking at income levels, access to certain services as far as like medical care, mental health care, um, even child care, things like that. Um, so I started out there. Um, it was a really cool job, but it actually ended up getting bought out by like a private company. Um, and I still felt like my interests weren't being fully tapped into. So I was like, I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of choose another path. So I ended up 
pretty quickly getting another job offer and I worked at a nonprofit. Um, they were called the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. If you guys have ever heard of them, it's a pretty small office, but architecture, policy, everything like that. Um, so it was really cool because it kind of brought me back to my academic roots at DePaul um, and being involved in that community, but also meeting people who are then professionals, government leaders, um, as well as private sector leaders, people who do consultation on urban planning um, and understanding that like there is both a private and a public sector to this field and you know the different nuances and roles that those groups play. Um, so kind of being in the room where it happens really inspired me to look into again um, what I really am interested in care about. Um, so when I was there, I was doing a lot of event and programming. Um, so I was almost tapping back into my RA role, um, but that was when I realized that I don't necessarily wanna be the one planning events for urban planning, I wanna be the one doing it. Um, and I kind of always knew that, um, but you know, the opportunity hadn't come across yet. I actually applied to CMAP earlier um, before I took the job at the nonprofit and I didn't get it that first time. Um, I also applied, got my final round interview, didn't get the job. So I was a little frustrated and I was just like, oh, maybe this government thing isn't gonna work for me. I'm gonna continue with this kind of nonprofit thing. Um, but after a few months there, which I know is not always traditional, I ended up deciding that I kind of wanted to look at other jobs again. Um, having had such a, short college experience of three years with COVID, I was just kind of still struggling to find that path. So if you just want to say like everyone struggles and I was, you know, I was really involved in school. I graduated with straight A's, three years, two majors, honors program. I thought I was going to, you know, get every job I wanted right away. And that wasn't the case. Um, but I continued to learn about myself, learn about, build those skills, build those connections. Um, so now that I had that job at the nonprofit, I was like, I have these connections to the urban planning world now. I'm going to try to apply again. Um, they had a few open positions at the entry level. So I applied actually for two different roles, um, same title, analyst title. Um, and I ended up being interviewed for both. Um, and I got the one that I'm at now. Um, and it was a pretty quick process, actually. I interviewed, had a second round interview within the same week and was started there two weeks later. Um, so it was, and ever since I've been there, it's been incredible and it's exactly what I wanted. And I'm so happy that I took my time to kind of figure it out. Um, and I'm happy that I knew when it was time to leave at the jobs that I was at. Because a lot of people told me to stick it out to, you know, oh, it's going to look bad. But honestly, they were more interested in just my academic history, my passion and all of that. So just remembering that that kind of shines through as well. Yeah, and it's that's a really difficult just like skill to develop is knowing when it is time to leave because it can actually cause a lot of damage to your just like career hopes and aspirations. And I appreciate you being so transparent about just like we're told so much about like what makes the perfect student that'll make the perfect like work candidate, but it's like we can do everything we think we're supposed to do and it'll still be a difficult decision or it's still going to take steps to get to where we want to go. Um, talking a little bit more about your current role, can you kind of describe maybe what the like day-to-day -day responsibilities might look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said earlier, what's cool is that we kind of have a diverse workload. Um, so a lot of what I do is data analysis. I'm in spreadsheets. I'm looking at financial numbers, what money we've committed, what years, making sure that our program is in order and that our money is being um, let for construction as soon as it's ready. Um, everything's very timely. So managing a calendar and um, we actually are what's called quasi federal quasi state. So we're funded by state and federal money. Um, so we have both the federal fiscal year and the state fiscal year to keep in mind. So yeah, no, it's, it's a lot. Um, so you have to be pretty meticulous as far as like being on top of those kind of deadlines. Um, the federal government is not playing around. Um, so I do a lot of that, just staying on top of everything. Um, I am obviously a support to the people who have been there for many, many years and have been in this programming um, and do a lot of the more um, interpersonal and intergovernmental relations. Um, so we work really closely with IDOT, the Illinois Department of Transportation, as well as CDOT, Chicago Department of Transportation, um, City of Chicago, Cook County. Um, our region actually encompasses 
seven counties, not just Cook County. So we have the city of Chicago, but we also go all the way out to McKinney County. If anyone knows where those are, they're 50 miles away. They're kind of far. Um, so we extend out for a wide range of stuff. Um, so one thing that I do with that as well is I'm a local government liaison for Gilberts, Illinois. It is a super small suburb, very far from the city. It's one of the furthest out of any of them, but I actually grew up in the town next to it. So another small town. So they kind of put me in that role to work with the local government officials um, for the village of Gilbert. So I think that's really cool is actually being able to talk to the village leaders um, of somewhere that's 50 miles away, but that I grew up, you know, right there. Um, so that's awesome. Um, we also do a lot of public hearings, which is super cool. So this is less of the analyst role um, and more of just making sure that our agendas are ready, our minutes are prepared. There's a lot of, again, legal stuff and like requirements that we have to fulfill through the federal government. Um, so keeping the like the books in order is really like a big thing when it comes to that, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, and then we also work on a number of different planning projects. Um, so right now I'm working with IDOT um, on a road improvement corridor study, um, which is essentially me doing the research role. Um, so less of the analysis, less of the programming into the research. Um, and that's where I'm actually going out. I'm reaching out to cycling advocacy advocacy groups in the city, um, looking at traffic count data from IDOT, looking at maps, creating my own maps, um, lots of cool stuff um, just to relay back to IDOT and kind of communicate with them about what our local needs are as far as cycling like, infrastructure, um, and then how that correlates to existing plans and what plans we can make to improve it. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of day-to-day -day stuff, but trust me, my day is like broken up into like two hours of all of that every day, basically. Um, and I also, I know this is not necessarily um, a task, but I would like to say it is also a hybrid schedule. I know that's something that a lot of people are thinking of now, especially with remote school, in-person school, these kind of transitions that we've seen after COVID. Um, we are 50-50 in the office in person, which has been super, super nice flexibility and super like comfortable schedule to be in. My first job was fully remote. My second job was fully in person. So this one is kind of feels like the perfect um, combination of the two, but it's definitely something to consider as well when you're thinking about what you want your day to look like. No, I think that's really important to point out just like the flexibilities that we have with work nowadays and just like as we're considering, okay, what is my job going to look like post-graduation? Is it is it on your hit list? Like if a hybrid job's on your hit list, maybe don't apply to somewhere that's there. Yeah. Um, or fully remote's on your hit list, then definitely don't apply to anywhere that's fully remote or fully in person. <laughs> yeah. Um, moving on, you've kind of have touched on some of the skills that you've developed in school and that you're currently using in your job. Um, but getting into a little bit more detail, what would you say the hard skills are? So these would be more of like the technological or like things that you really had to get trained on that you found key to your role. Yeah, um, so I, I saw the question in the chat as well about um, GIS and Excel, and I would definitely say yes, yes, <laughs> you should know GIS and Excel. Um, Excel, especially, um, I actually had to take an Excel test. Um, as part of the interview process. Um, it wasn't anything too crazy, but it was just basically like, it was literally a module where you were in Excel and like they would ask you to do a certain thing and you would have to show on the program that you knew how to do it. Um, so Excel is super um, important if you can learn how to write macros on Excel, which I would not say is necessary, but if you can learn it, um, I think it would be super helpful. I actually ended up learning on the job JavaScript and I don't claim to know it fully, I am not a coder, um, but I learned it to make some of the functionality of our um, intergovernmental forms easier. Um, so that was a super cool, hard skill to learn. It was something I was interested in too. I've always wanted to know how to code and do stuff like that. So I feel like really cool. <laughs> um, and then GIS, of course. Um, I don't use GIS a whole lot in my role. I have created very basic level maps. Um, and used it in kind of a very simple capacity, but there are people on my team and within CMAP that use it every single day. Um, so especially if you're looking for something where you know, might not necessarily wanna be within the transportation improvement program, but rather you know, on the planning team, on the legislative affairs team, um, it may be really important to have those skills. Um, so definitely that. Um, I would also say 
that Stata or R would be really good to know. I had actually used both of them in my academic coursework. They're both um, data analytics software. Um, I'm in an R, they put me in an R class <laughs> for my job though. So I'm learning it even more, um, but it is cool too. CMAP does have funding to kind of send us into these educational experiences. I'm also taking a class through CMAP um, at Rutgers University online about federal finance. So they actually offer these specific courses, but if you're able to take these under your belt, Paul, I would say that it's probably gonna be super useful. Like I would, I consider myself really knowledgeable about policy um, and you know different governmental like grants and stuff, but I am still learning. Um, so a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and then I would say, um, this is more of a class and less of a hard skill, but definitely if you have an opportunity to take statistics or calculus, dive into that a lot. Um, as an econ major, I was in the economics honors program as well, so I was required to take them. Um, they're not required for every econ major though, so a little like asterisk that if you're in the econ program, I would recommend kind of deepening those math skills just because they're never going to hurt to have. You know, if you're the person in the room that can run the regression, if you're the person in the room that can write macro, if you're the person in the room that can program a PDF to work a certain way, it really does influence, you know, what you can do and kind of the projects you can get involved in. Um, so not just to get the job, but to enjoy your, your job as well. It just helps to kind of have a good variety of stuff. Um, and also I would say be comfortable skill. Um, but there is a lot of interacting with the public as well, which I find very fun and I'm very extroverted. Um, but I understand that, you know, if you're, you know, a little bit more introverted, it could be very difficult. And I think that it, it, it'll take you a long way in this career and many careers. Yeah. I know, I think people would be surprised about how often statistics pop up in like very non-mathematical related roles. Um, you kind of just very briefly touched on this in terms of just like talking to the public, but what would be some of the soft skills that you kind of use in your role? So these are what we think of as more like interpersonal or communication based. Yeah, so definitely be comfortable talking in front of a group of people. I've already had to do it um, and interacting with the public is a big thing. Um, I would also say just be diligent about your leadership skills. I know I touched on that earlier as well, um, but I know that's something that they were looking for is someone who has kind of been able to manage projects before. And that, you know, I mean, I worked at a gym, so like that is, it, it translates though. And so anywhere you can find that opportunity to really put your passion into something I think is really important. Um, and I also think that they wanna see people who are involved in their community one way or another, because as urban planners and as the metropolitan, so that's not just Chicago, but again, the whole surrounding area, they wanna see people who know what's going on, who care about what's going on. Um, I have always been involved in, like I mentioned many times already, cycling advocacy. I've always been involved in it, I've been in groups um, and I am very heavily involved in bike Twitter. Um, and so like kind of having that understanding of, some of the nuances to the policies and the programs that we're creating within the agency, um, I think is super important. Um, so to be involved, you know, can mean a number of things. I, when I was at DePaul, I was in the community, uh, DCSA, DePaul Community Service Association. Yeah, that's what it stands for. Um, and I was able to go and volunteer within the community, which it was again, just super impactful to be able to speak to in my interview to say, you know, I've not only, you know, been around here as someone who lives in Chicago, who bikes in Chicago, who walks in Chicago, um, but I've also served the community in Chicago and I wanna serve the community a little bit deeper. So demonstrating that commitment to, you know, I'm not just here to go to school in the city. I'm not just here, you know, to spend my twenties here and have fun, but I really do care about, you know, mm -hmm. The government and the policy and the people, um, I think, is a soft skill that is really important. And I, everyone I work with is so smart and passionate. Like it is crazy. I don't know where they're finding these people, but I think everyone should try to be that person. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of times, like in conversations that I've had with students already, they it's an under people underestimate how important it is that that your interests relate to like potential careers that you're involved in or those like part-time jobs that we have, like student, a lot of student employment positions really develop a lot of those like soft skills needed for our future careers. Um, moving on, what has been like the most rewarding aspect of your job? And then could you also touch on what has been the most challenging? Yeah, all right. So the most rewarding part I would say is 
and if I haven't conveyed this enough already, is being able to actually work in something I'm super passionate in, especially because my first two jobs out of school didn't quite meet the mark. Um, it was kind of nice to have something where I just felt smart again. I felt like in my element, and I think that's just so important to be somewhere that you care about the mission, that you care about what's going on. I mean, a salary is a salary and, you know, whatever, but I, I've never been, I mean, I need to pay the bills, but I've never been too concerned about that. It's always been about kind of that mission um, and the values. Um, and so I would just say that's the most rewarding is to just finally be in the room that I've wanted to be in forever um, and to learn more. I would definitely consider myself a lifelong learner. They made us do a Clifton Strengths Finder at my job too. Um, and my number one skill was being a learner. So kind of just being surrounded by those, like I said, passionate people is in, at such a young age, I think will just carry throughout my career so well. Um, as far as the most challenging thing goes, um, I actually am the youngest full-time staff member at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, um, which is difficult. It's, it's, it's definitely hard to be a young person in the professional world right now, especially when a lot of people who have been there for a long time we're there pre-COVID and, you know, a lot of things have changed in our young lives. Um, and I know I keep bringing up COVID, but I mean, it's a thing that happened to all of us. Um, and I think that kind of bridging that gap and realizing like, I belong here. I, even though I'm the youngest, like they still respect me that, you know, my work matters that I'm capable, um, you know, I think that has been the biggest challenge. I mean, the, the, the data analysis is hard, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like working with those numbers, doing the math. But that was something I was trained to do. And it, it's something that was not necessarily um, something I learned, especially with online school and not having as much internship opportunities, just working with colleagues from a variety of different experiences and backgrounds, um, age ranges. Um, yeah, it was just, it was an interesting hurdle to overcome. But I think that it's important to remember that if you get a job anywhere, or even if you're interviewing or applying somewhere, to believe that you belong there. Mm -hmm. I think it's super important. Yeah, navigating age gaps at work is very difficult. And it's something that I constantly have to remind myself. And I think you made a very good point right there. Just like, well, like, if you are getting interviews, you are qualified. If you got the job, you are qualified to be there. And it's hard because we have so much like internal doubt. And then not everyone at our workplace is going to be externally supportive of us, especially if we are a younger professional. Um, can you, so you talked about this a lot, this might be more related to your fellowship that you got for J.B. Pritzker, but can you talk a lot about like how networking has really shaped your professional journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I did not get this job through any LinkedIn connections. That would have been like such a great story, but I, I am big on LinkedIn. I'm trying to hit 500 connections feel free to add me after this. Um, but I would say, I think that the biggest thing has just been meeting people involved in the field. So one of the most influential people from my fellowship was my direct manager, um, who I'm now realizing was just a recent college grad, but to me, she was like this like older, wiser woman who could like help me. Um, and she was super passionate about politics, super passionate about elections. Um, we actually follow each other on Twitter now, so we're really cool. Um, but seeing her involvement, I think, in government and politics um, really opened kind of my eyes um, to what is possible, what I can seek out, um, and how I could potentially get there. Um, and I think that networking actually helped me the most in just having letters of recommendation. Um, so this role did require, I think, three referrals where they like actually want them to fill out this written thing. Um, and so having good people to recommend you who truly know you, who can speak to your skills, who want to see you succeed, I think is one of the biggest things with networking is we think like, oh, well, if someone can't directly get us a job or, you know, into their company, then that connection's useless. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily true because even asking someone to look over your resume, asking someone to be that referral for you, asking someone to read a cover letter or, give a fake interview, um, I think that those are all super helpful. And I did all of those things really in this role because I really, really wanted it. Um, so my network includes, you know, old professors as well as former bosses, as well as people who are colleagues, fellow students of mine. Um, and kind of having that range of perspectives, I think was super important to me, just 
being the strongest candidate I could be and putting my best foot forward. And your network should know how you shine and should help you show that. Thank you. And everything that uh, Sarah mentioned about like having someone look over your resume to interview prep is all stuff we can do at the Career Center. Just another little, little shout fun. out <laughs> about what we can do to help. Um, okay, in terms of resources, um, do you have any that um, you would recommend for someone to check out if they're interested in going into public policy or research or urban planning? This is nerdy, but I would say look at public data. Like public data, if you truly want to be a planner, if you truly want to do what I do and what my colleagues do, we are so driven by numbers, by looking at what's going on in communities, understanding like one of the biggest, um, there's a list of values for CMAP. Um, and one of the ones I at least mentioned in my interview, they asked me what, what value do you value most of you know, the list? Um, and I said, the one where we say that we tell the stories that the data shows. Because um, I think it's important to know that data is not just numbers, but it that does kind of portray reality in a way that we can make uh, mathematical, put it into models and see not only what's happening, but what can happen. Um, so there's the Chicago Public Data Portal. They have such cool stuff on there. So if you're doing a research project, if you're in a class, you want to write a paper about it, 10 out of 10, like I used it so much. My professors love to see it. Um, and they have some really cool rich data sets, even about like Divi bikes, like it, it, anything you're curious about in Chicago, housing, transportation, you know, economic funding, it's it's all out there. Um, CMAP actually has a public data portal. So plugging our own, um, if you go to, um, I wanna say it's cmap.illinois.com, our website, we have a little tab that says data and you can look at our community data snapshots, um, which I had a hand in working on, um, as well as some of the other stuff we've put together just to know what's going on, be involved. Um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, who didn't hire cool data though, um, you can look at there. Um, but I would definitely say um, just educate yourself what's going on about what's going on and be familiar with how that data could be useful. Um, and if you wanna work at a public agency or just in urban planning in general, I would just kind of look at who's doing it. Cause there's also private sector, um, which I didn't really think was for me but it is for a lot of people and you can do a lot of cool stuff in urban planning there. So ACOM would be a cool company to look into, A-E-C-O-M um, as well as Deloitte. Um, we had them working on us as consultants for a certain project and Deloitte has a number of, they have so much going on, but somewhere cool to look into. You don't think of them first when you think of urban planning, but it's somewhere to check out. Um, and then there's also, we work with Baker Tilly as well. So again, they do a array of stuff. They have public accountants, they have all kinds of things, but again, they also do have people that help us with our data. Um, so just seeing what's out there, what's possible um, and thinking about whether or not you would wanna go private or public. Um, and I know people at my job who have done both, who have been consultants and then gone to public and then gone back to private. And you know, there's a lot of differences between them and understanding that can really inform your career path. Do you want to take a couple minutes just to speak briefly on what the biggest differences are between public and private? Sure. Um, I mean, I haven't necessarily worked in the private sector as far as the best of your goes. understanding yes. from your public from sector perspective. My public sector perspective, um, I mean, I'll be very candid, private sector will probably pay you more, <laughs> um, but you will probably have longer hours um, and a less, less flexible budget and schedule. Um, so what's really cool about working in the public sector is one, I get a cool pension, so that's fun. Um, my retirement is taken care of. And honestly, they do have pretty competitive salaries. Like, um, I mean, this is the most money I've ever made. Um, but the, I would say be aware that you might be making less, but they're normally able to compete, especially if you have another offer from somewhere else. Um, but what's cool about us is that, um, we don't really have the same economic incentives as private companies. So private companies are trying to make money. They're trying to meet the bottom line um, and they can do some really cool, really efficient stuff. And they have really strong teams, big teams um, where you can kind of get your hands all over a lot of stuff. Whereas in the public sector, we have a little bit more wiggle room. We're not, tr we get tax dollars. So um, it's not like, oh, we, we make the Chicago Metropolitan Agency unhappy or the Chicago Metropolitan Area people unhappy and then we'll take back our money. We have their money. Um, and we have cool federal grants. 
that we're working with the state government and the federal government with. Um, so I think one of the biggest differences is just having kind of that flexibility in the public sector to be a little bit slower on projects, do the more research, more analysis, really see it to fruition um, and even take time to learn um, is a really cool involved in there and also just meeting public officials. I think it's really cool. You're not gonna really meet them in the private sector. You'll meet like CEOs maybe, um, but like meeting like mayors um, and people who work for like the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Transportation Administration. Um, you know, these are people who are pretty big uh, in Washington DC even. Um, I think that's a really cool opportunity. Um, but yeah, basically to summarize that all up, a public sector job, you're gonna be doing the work, you're gonna have more time and you're gonna see the plan from start to finish to implementation and everything. In the private sector, you'll be able to make the plan, consult someone on it. A lot of it's gonna be consultancy and then someone else is gonna take it to actually do it. Um, so if that makes sense, I don't I don't really know. No, that makes a lot um, of sense. Uh, you uh, yeah. done really thoroughly and I put you on the spot. So <laughs> thank you so much. I've thought a lot. I actually did apply to ACOM, but I okay. didn't see that. So um and then we're gonna reach our last question on my end today before we open it up to community questions. But where do you see your professional journey taking you over the next few years? Maybe let's say where do you see yourself in the next five years? Yeah, so um, that's a question on everyone's, I feel like everyone's asking me that as a young person. Um, if I'm being honest, I see myself staying at CMAP. Um, like I mentioned, one of the coolest things is that people move around a lot. Um, and I know a lot of people who were once on the team I'm on, the Transportation Improvement Program team, who are now in a totally different division, even doing totally different stuff. So that ability to kind of switch titles, switch roles, switch workloads, I think has been super cool. And it just seems like there's a lot of longevity within the um, agency. Um, and if I'm being honest, and I know this isn't quite career, but I do plan on going back to school um, to get my master's degree. Um, a lot of my colleagues have master's degrees in urban planning. I would say it's almost like nine out of 10 people you ask at the agency will have a master's degree in urban planning. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what I want to do or pursue further into economics or public policy. So that's kind of why I'm in this in between. Um, but what's awesome and what I mentioned about working in the public sector is that they're going to pay for me to go back to school. Um, so that's something to really consider is that it, does your employer kind of have those incentive programs and that tuition reimbursement? Um, because now I'm going to be able, I love school. I'm a total nerd. If I haven't conveyed that yet, making it very clear, I love academia. And that was, you know, something I've missed. And so knowing that I can work part-time for them and they'll help me go to school part-time is so cool. Um, and really shows that they're gonna invest in me. So I do plan on sticking around. Um, and after that, I think that I'll probably stay in the public sector. Um, I'd love to work for a local government. Um, I'd love to work for the city of Chicago. I would love to work in nonprofits again, eventually as well. Um, but I, as the education, nonprofit and governmental career, um, that is very much where I plan to stay. Um, I have found my spot. Um, I think I knew it. I, th I think I knew it in my heart for a long time. Um, but I am pretty certain about it now and having the connections that I have now, I couldn't imagine that I'll have a hard time sticking around. Yeah. I felt very similar. Like prior coming into this role, I was like, I know it's going to be an education nonprofit or government. I just don't know <laughs> what it's going to be in. Um, but to everyone watching, Sarah makes a really good point about taking a gap year or taking a couple years off from uh, going to grad school, especially because so many public sector institutions and organizations do offer that credit reduction or will like pay for you to go back to school. Grad school, very similar to undergraduate, is a big financial commitment. And so if grad school is something that you're interested in, um, it would be something that you would want to consider is taking a gap year and then applying to organizations that are going to help you get that additional degree. Okay, with that said, we are done with all of our pre-planned questions. Um, if you have any questions uh, that you want Sarah to answer, uh, feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, I will give you about a minute or so to put them in. 
You can also um, raise your hand and to unmute yourself if you'd rather just ask directly and not type it all out in the chat. Uh, Amania, you can go ahead and unmute and ask. Hi, uh, it was a very informational se uh, session and I'm so glad I it uh, today. Um, I just have a question for Sarah. Um, I don't know if you have like interacted with many people around in the scene map. International student from Pakistan and I what I am having a hard time right now while I'm applying for jobs and internships and stuff is that uh, many organizations are, and for very good reason here in the US, but have you, in, like in your experience, have you interacted or do you know of someone or do you feel that CMAP or any other agencies like that uh, would be willing to hire international students because I'm pretty sure Deloitte and ACOM, the private sector, would be more than willing to hire. But what do you feel about CMAP? Uh, because I, I kind of like know about the CMAP and I think that it is really something I, it is an organization I would really want to get into. But I'm just wanted to, I just wanted to know like, how do you feel about people uh, getting hired who are not actually from the US? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would say CMAP is actually very diligent about their diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we do have staff from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and we actually did have an intern past summer who was a student from India. Um, so I would say they're more than willing to kind of get the perspective of international students. Um, we're more than aware within the agency that the United States is not the only place with cities with, you know, an urban atmosphere. Um, and so we do seek to learn from all of those kind of perspectives. Um, and we seek to hire candidates that come with, you know, not everyone who works at CMAP, like I'm from the Chicago metropolitan area, I went to school here, um, very traditional pathway, but that is actually not the case for a lot of my coworkers. Um, I actually worked with someone who was from the US Virgin Islands as well. Um, and they just added so much perspective about what what cities could look like outside of the traditional continental United States. Um, and, you know, people, I have a limited experience of like knowing this is Illinois, I know what Illinois is like, I've been here my whole life. Um, so I think that as much as the private sector embraces it, we embrace it as well. Um, I do know that we have a requirement that you do have to live within the city of Chicago as your permanent address, or um, I think within the region actually, um, as your permanent address um, within like a year of working there or something like that, just because of the ways are distributed. Um, but, and that can be an impetus to some of the, you know, state and local jobs as well, um, is if there are residency requirements. Um, but I think that as far as interning even, um, there's a lot more flexibility with that. And then that way you can kind of make those connections and know, you know, do I want to be here permanently? Do I not? Um, anything like that. So I hope that answers your, your question. Amana, um, and any other student, uh, international students who may be watching, um, a good resource to check out, and I'm going to drop the link in the chat, is myvisajobs.com. This website helps you find out who is applying um, or like who's hiring and what kind of like visas and if they will support your visa or sponsor it, as well as h1bgrader.com. That is another very similar resource as well. Um, Alejandro, I will let you uh, ask your question in one second, but one of the questions that we had in the chat was, did career fairs help you get your job? Um, I would not say that it was like one link to the other, but I did go to career fairs when I went to DePaul. Like I said, I was involved and I went to a lot of stuff on campus. I lived on campus. Um, and as an RA, I try to show up to all the stuff. Um, so I would definitely say career fairs are a good way to network, to meet people, to understand what's out there. Um, the odds that exactly who you want to work for are going to be at the career fair it may not be exactly, you know, the, you know, the one job you're dreaming of is going to be there. I don't, I don't think CMAP goes to career fairs. Um, but I think it's a good opportunity just to know people, to talk to people. I think that perspective is so important in your career that the more perspective you can gain from other people, the better. DePaul, actually, we are having our career fair, two-day career fair next week. So on Wednesday, we have an in-person career fair. And then on Thursday, we have a virtual component. 
check both of the days out different some employers are hosting tables both days some employers are one day versus another so that's another thing for you to check out okay alejandro hi yeah um you mentioned that um most of the people you're working with have masters in urban planning um mm -hmm. as someone who would rather you know take that gap before going to graduate school what do you think are like good things that you can do in those years off um, to like prepare yourself and set yourself apart from other people applying for those jobs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say just to preface it, I was a little because the position I applied for said master's degree preferred. And I was like, oh, well, I don't have a master's degree. I have a bachelor's degree. Um, and I, I did want to take the gap year regardless. So I didn't feel bad about like, oh, I should be in school. Um, but I think that what's super important is just gaining experience in every little thing you can. Um, so like I explained, like before I was at CMAP, I had two jobs for a few months each. Um, and while I was there, as much as, you know, I wasn't loving the job, I tried to do everything that they would offer me. If they need someone to help with a research project, I want to be on that project. If they need someone to do graphic design. I want to graphic design it. I will learn any skill that they wanted me to learn um, just because being able to speak to that in the interview for the job that I really wanted was so impactful um, and being able to add all of that to my resume and you know not establish myself just as oh I'm a recent grad with a bachelor's degree you know there's hundreds of thousands of people who are recent grads with a bachelor's degree in the city of Chicago but to say I have done this I have done this confidently I have done this with clear outcomes I think is super important and even as someone who's kind of still in those gap years before going back to school because I still only have my bachelor's degree while I'm at CMAP really it has been about learning what other people studied, what their programs were like, where their trajectory was. Um, I actually sat down with our executive director who was like our equivalent of like a CEO, it's like the top boss at CMAP. Um, and I said, what, how did you get here? You know, the, your job is so cool and I respect you so much. Like what, you know, did you do? And she talked to me about, she also took a gap year. She had studied graphic design in her undergrad and did not ever imagine going into urban planning, um, but she worked and she, you know, just like me kind of came into those connections where she learned about the urban planning field. She learned more about policy. She got involved in community action. Um, and so when she went into her grad program, she knew exactly what she was looking for, what she wanted to get out of it, which I think is really big is asking yourself before you go back to school, why am I going back to school? You know, what am I gonna take from, you know, obviously going from your bachelor's right to your master's, you're a student, but what am I gonna take to my career that I have established with this kind of additional degree? Um, and yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question. I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of a recent grad. It's been a year, um, but uh, I definitely think that, you know, and I'm again, someone who I'd rather be in school um, than working, but I think that being able, like, I also was like, if I do my master's and I don't work, I will have no worldly perspective. And so really just trying to gain all that perspective, I think is so important. Yeah, thank you, that was helpful. Yeah. We have a question from Gio, um, and it says, what courses would you recommend taking if you want to go into urban planning and architecture? Ah, that's a good one. I mean, architecture actually takes some fun art classes because all the architects that I know are really cool and artsy, um, but that, that's a more of a side note. Um, if you're into urban planning, um, I would definitely say take public policy classes. That was actually one thing that I kind of regret doing is that because I was a double major and the honors program and I was set on graduating early, I didn't get to have a lot of wiggle room in the many different disciplines that are involved in urban planning. So as much as I'm an expert in economics and political science, I don't know as much about public policy. I don't know as much about women's and gender studies. I don't know um, a lot about, you know, geography and sociology and all of those things really do connect back. And I know a lot of the social sciences can seem similar to each other, but they're so distinct as well in a number of different ways. Um, so having those competencies, I think is just really important is to be able to speak to the wide ranging a variety of things going on in the world. Um, one of our biggest goals and our values at CMAP is equity. Um, and so taking time to take courses, not just on the technical skills that you may get um, with a statistics econometrics course, um, but also taking time to just learn about society, even history, um, I think is gonna be really important. Um, and then architecture as well. Um, if I haven't doubled down on this enough, math. 
math, 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 take math classes. I know they're not the most fun, but it's really cool when you're able to do math and show that because then you can go anywhere. And I mean, I mentioned the person on my team who has an engineering degree and planning because she has that calculus background. She has that statistic background. And I think that companies and organizations and agencies today are really looking for those qualitative Mm -hmm. skills. And I will say too, if you are a part of the honors program here at DePaul, learning domains look a little bit differently than they would for a standard student, but um, take advantage of your learning domains um, because it really allows you the space to explore those types of classes. Um, I think that is, okay, okay, beautiful. That is all the time we have for today. I wanna uh, just extend a thank you from all of us to Sarah for taking this hour to speak with us. Um, Before everyone heads off, I am going to launch a poll just to kind of gauge everyone's thoughts on today's events. So before you exit out, feel free, please take a moment just to answer the quick three questions. Um, But that was our event today. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to get in contact with me. I'm going to put a link to Handshake in my email and chat. Sarah, feel free to put any of your contact information in the chat as well. Yeah, let me get, drop you guys a link to my LinkedIn. Um, I'm not just trying to gain my connections. I actually, you know, if you have any further questions, um, feel free to hit me up. Um, and I also have a part job on DePaul's campus. I am a fitness instructor at the Ray. So, if you want to ask me questions in person, you can find me on the Ray schedule, which I always have to plug regardless because I love fitness and maybe you'll see me there and you can be an urban planner who teaches classes on the side too, if you'd like. Um, and I find it very fulfilling to have two careers as well. So um, I just dropped a link to just you and it's just yeah. my, yeah, I know I realize <laughs> that. See, this is, I haven't used Zoom in so long. I'm like doing it wrong. We were just right. talking about that too. All right. Hopefully that worked now. Um, but yeah. And then I can also give you guys my personal email address just in case you have more specific questions or you're not on LinkedIn. Um, because I, I'm really an open book. I'm also trying to start my career and learn more about it. And I'm, you know, want to be a student and everything. Um, So as much as I do have this cool, nice, amazing job, um, I'm also a peer. So feel free to reach out for anything. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah, again. And thank you everyone else for joining today. That is the end of our event. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.